Today's sponsor is Reading Horizons, developers of a foundational K3 reading program that focuses on decoding and encoding using skills, the critical components of structured literacy tier one. Reading Horizons programs deliver proven supplemental core literacy instruction based on the science of reading and put the Reading Horizons podcast named Podclast on your must-watch, must-listen list and take a deep dive into learning-focused topics such as structured literacy, social-emotional learning, dyslexia, and ed tech with host Laura Axtell, an educator and trainer with over 26 years of experience in instructional and administrative settings. The next season of Podclast begins Wednesday, June 16th. And be sure to listen to past episodes anytime on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and most podcasting platforms. Visit readinghorizons.com backslash podcast to learn more. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Teaching, Reading, and Learning, the TRL podcast. I'm your host, Laura Stewart. The focus of this podcast is to elevate important conversations in the educational community to inspire and inform and celebrate contributions to our community. Today, my guest is Dr. Marianne Wolf. I mean, pinch me. Uh, for those of you who may not know Marianne, I'll introduce you to her by uh, reading to you her biography. Dr. Marianne Wolf is a scholar, a teacher, and an advocate for children and literacy around the world. She is the director of the newly created Center for Dyslexia, Diverse Learners, and Social Justice at the UCLA Graduate School of Education and Information Studies. Previously, she was a professor of citizenship and public service and director of the Center of Reading and Language Research in the Elliott Pearson Department of Child Study and Human Development at Tufts University. She is the author of Proust and the Squid, The Story and the Science of the Reading Brain, Dyslexia, Fluency in the Brain, Tales of Literacy for the 21st Century, and most recently, Reader Come Home, The Reading Brain in the Digital World. Dr. Wolf's many awards include the highest honors from the International Dyslexia Association and the Dyslexia Foundation, Distinguished, Re Distinguished Researcher of the Year for Learning Disabilities in Australia, Distinguished Teacher of the Year from the American Psychological Association, and the Christopher Columbus Award for Intellectual Innovation for co-founding Curious Learning, a Global Literacy Initiative, with deployments in Africa, India, Australia, and rural United States. She is also the recipient of the Reading League's Benita Blackman Award in honor of her extraordinary contributions for literacy. And finally, Marianne has been elected to the Vatican Academy of Science. Dr. Wolf is an eminent author and researcher and educator whose work has had worldwide impact. And she's also had personal impact on so many people, including me. Um, this is a real treasure of a podcast. Thanks for tuning in and welcome. Welcome, Marianne. It's my delight to be speaking with you today. I, I just am so honored to have you as part of my life, and I'm just so delighted to be speaking to you so that we can share um, ideas, big ideas today with our listeners. So thank you. Well, Laura, when I, when I realized we were going to have this conversation, first I was feeling like, oh, what joy just to have this this opportunity to really think out loud with you because we have such shared hopes and we have shared background and we have a shared commitment to putting knowledge into the world so that the world becomes a wiser place. And I kept thinking today of Marilyn Robinson. She, she usually is known as the novelist who wrote Gilead and, and this beautiful set of books. But she also wrote essays called The Givenness of Things. And she said something, and this was only a few years ago. She said, there has never been a time when our society needed wisdom and decency more. And so I, I think that as we talk about literacy, 
we're also talking about the bridge to to and when i say decency i mean the best of human beings and the very best is when wisdom and empathy come together and so i know that's what unites us laura that that those those shared goals for the next generation. Oh my goodness. Yes. So beautifully said. And I know you and I are both such huge Marilyn Robinson fans. <laughs> yes, that's why I began with her. <laughs> I just finished Jack. Oh my goodness. You did finish it? Or oh, isn't it just is it just fantastic? It's heart wrenching. It's heart wrenching. It's just yeah. it just you just you you feel it it's one of those and that's what you're you know when we're, we talk about how much we feel it and that we want that for our children we want them to have those experiences that expand their their passions and compassions you know in the world and literacy is a gateway to that it certainly is and when i think of marilyn robinson um each book and actually Obama called her something like an ambassador of empathy, but each book gives us an opportunity to literally leave ourselves and enter the lives of someone completely different from us. And of all the books, Gilead being still my favorite, Home, Housekeeping, they're wonderful, Lila, but Jack was the hardest because he is so unlike us and yet so like a piece of us. And that was what was so, um, I think, amazing about her ability to make an almost, um, uh, it's a, almost like a Russian Dostoevsky character out of someone we would see on the street and never realize all the thoughts, the guilt, the pain, the the desire that this person had, the desire to be good despite every circumstance that seemed against him. And that's that's who we walk, or at least we used to walk. <laughs> We will walk again among the Jacks and Lilas. And, you know, you're, you're so right, because he represented our better angels and our shadow self. And our shadows. And, and we, um, we really don't usually see that, that interiority of the shadow so well done in novels. At the same time, hoping for, in her terms, the redemptive. So we usually see the shadow or the, let's see, the aspiration to virtue. And here you have this one, um, in Hebrew, the term is Shekinah, the light that still lived inside this very Calvinist conscience. I mean, never was Calvinism so, I think, vividly brought to life as in Jack in recent times. It's not a a typical, and of course, Marilyn Robinson is anything but typical, but it is not a typical portrait. No, it's not. It's not. So you and I share, I mean, we share a love of that, but I also think we, when you talked about our, our backgrounds, you know, we, we both came from small Midwestern towns <laughs> and we both are in love with books. Yeah. And, and I know people would just love to hear more about your, your origin story, Marianne. Tell us about about that upbringing and, and your passion, your being a passionate and devoted reader. Right. Well, um, the reality is a very odd one since when I have actually heard people after I give a lecture, I've overheard them in the bathroom saying, where is she from? It must be New York. <laughs> Couldn't be farther from New York. <laughs> this is so funny to me when I hear people say that. It could not be further from New York City. It was the tiniest town. And in Proust and the Quid, and this is a Quid, Proust and the Squid, I said, it is a town where no one visits without intent. And what I meant by that, it's such a small place and you just drive right through it. And you would never know that actually, just as Marilyn Robinson portrays, there is this wonderful set of people who have the same struggles and the same pains, joys, 
as New York City, but in this place that, that has very little to offer in the terms that we think about as culture. And yet, I, I found there the most beautiful childhood in large part because of my family, my mother and my father, and their hopes to give their children everything they had and everything they didn't have. But the reality was that the only school, the only reason why they moved there from a relatively larger city was because there was a Catholic school and they wanted their children to have as close to an ethical um, background as they could give them. But <laughs> the school only had two rooms. That's what's so funny to me, even to this moment, that there I was, you know, stuck in the first and second grade roles, and I finished everything the fourth graders had already done. So it was the origin story is the story of a little girl who got in trouble because she had already finished the fourth grade material and the poor nun, Sister Rose Margaret, didn't know what to do. And so she actually had a parent meeting and said, as much as they appreciated how many times I interrupted the class with my hand up for everything, that it was disruptive. And perhaps if they could have books and there was no library in these two rooms and my parents who were not they at that moment they were anything but well to do and they nevertheless gave a library of books to the back of my room and so from second grade on i had what would what, what what the city kids would have called the great books program. So I just, I read my way through those shelves and mm. the little librarian um, was my friend. I mean, she really was my friend. She was my neighbor, you know, every, it's a everybody knows different. everybody, right. It's <laughs> Susie Menzies mom. So, uh, so the librarian um, was accustomed to letting me just do whatever I wanted. And the books that I read, like the books you read, Laura, uh, formed a platform for the rest of my life. Uh, there's no question that books, I never ever felt deprived. I never felt like I had a poor or underprivileged environment because there was always somewhere to go, you know, somewhere. What? Yeah, and I, I just remember as a child just relishing times when I could just be with my books. Exactly. I just, you know, that was, that just... was a lot of time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So this was Sister Rose Margaret. That yes, a... well, there was Sister Rose Margaret, Sister Alicia, and then Sister Ignatius was grades five through eight. And there were only eight of us, but I will have to tell you, Laura, that the philosophy that those nuns, sisters, the school sisters of Notre Dame, this has nothing to do with religion, what I'm going to say. It has to do with commitment to teaching. And I think you and I have always shared something which you may not have known actually came from my observation of them. They would not rest until everyone knew how to read and knew how to be their best. And there was even, um, well, there were children who were what we would call neurodiverse. Uh, one was a Down syndrome little girl, and she Shirley was her name, and Shirley learned to read. Nobody had any thoughts that she was different. She just took longer. And the nuns would stay after school with those who didn't read. And by the eighth grade, out of eight kids, three of them have, two of them have PhDs. Uh, everybody graduated from high school and most graduated from college. It was just 
you learned to your potential. And that was the philosophy of teaching, which to this moment, you and I, this is what we do. Everyone is going to get there. Right. So that, so that really, they help shape you. First of all, like you said, Rose Margaret didn't know what to do with you, but she knew that if she could put a pile of books in front of you, right? right? So she shaped you in that way. And she also, they also shaped you with the way they lived their teaching commitment. That, that, that actually, um, that has stood me in good stead to this moment. When I think of teaching, when I think of the role of books, and then, as you know, I I went to I went to what was then St. Mary's in Notre Dame, and then after that, Northwestern, and all that was English literature. But all during that time was this this nascent desire: What am I going to do about kids? And so I took a year off. And that was the other part of the origin story that really is the, the bridge. Uh, I took a year off in a Peace Corps-like setting. And it was in supposed to be in a Native American reservation in the Dakotas. Fell through last minute. They sent me. And it, it, I know that I've said this to some people before and they don't understand it, but Laura, you will. I was embarrassed to be sent to Hawaii. <laughs> What political cachet do you get from going to teach in Hawaii? I mean, even though it was the most poverty of Yeah, but it it doesn't yeah, it doesn't sound like that destination for your it doesn't sound like the destination for your altruistic heart, right? But of course it turned out to be, right? It turned out to be the the deciding after you know, after being in the midst of them and loving them and knowing them. I know their names to this moment, Laura. Uh, they, they made me understand that if you do not become literate, you will be, and most of, most of them were like 10 languages, but most of them were Filipino um, families who were practic- for all purposes indentured servants. They, they wanted their children to be literate. And that was, this is a, this is a, a very odd thing to say, but I had all this desire to give them what we would call authentic literature and story. But I failed at least 10 to 20 percent of the kids. And from that point on, I realized I had truly failed their whole lives by not by not getting them to the point where they could truly read. And that just did something. And, and, and I, I will say that it wasn't the case that they didn't love learning. We loved each other. We loved learning. We did everything right in that area. But it, it a very, you know, I have such empathy with people who have the desire to teach through whole language. And in a very real way, I was a whole language teacher. I believe that language and stories would be enough. And what I found out before I knew anything about reading or what that there was a war approaches, I didn't know anything. anything, right? But I experienced what happens when you do your absolute best at that and you still fail a a large group of kids. And that was it, I left English literature. I left the study of the poet Rilke. I went to the Harvard Reading Lab. I didn't know anything about, oh my God, Jean Chaw was, I walked into Jean Chaw's office and told her how much I loved her work on child language. And it went on and on and on. At the end of what she said, you know, you're actually talking about Courtney Kasdan, not me. <laughs> Oh my God, it was horrible. And it, it, it was, we had, a, it, I had to overcome some really serious disagreements with Jean Shaw, but she became at the end of my work there, one of the great models. The great golden heart of Jean Shaw is what under, un, still underlies her great contribution to understanding reading development. 
And then I went into neuroscience across the road and that was a struggle because I had entered the reading lab as an educator and yet Carol Chomsky and Norman Geshwin, their work it actually transformed my whole way of thinking about reading. And I realized that's when I have to study the reading brain. And it was tough because Laura, in those days, neuroscience was not au courant. It was not something that everybody wanted. In fact, people really objected to me doing that in the beginning. And then slowly the realization of how much that can teach us um, took over. And then by the time I graduated, that was not the case, but it was really, it was important to go with both the best of what was there and the best of what I thought could be added to our understanding of reading through neuroscience. So what, what specific, yeah, so when you talk about like Chomsky, what, what specifically did you learn that made, that changed everything? You said it kind of changed everything around your ideas around reading. What was it? Well, you know, it's so odd that you ask just that question because only two days ago, I was interviewed for a book, a new biography on Chomsky, and they asked me about Carol what and Carol's on my mind right now because of that interview, but also because she understood that if you are really to appreciate the complexity of reading, you must understand linguistics to a certain extent. Now, not the to the extent of understanding formal or, or more structural formal linguistics like Noam taught it. And I did take those courses too, uh, Merrill Garrett. Um, uh, uh, there were so many amazing people at that time that were involved in linguistics, but they, but especially Carol, taught me that understanding the structure of language is absolutely imperative to understanding reading itself. So a lot of people in speech language are studying those processes and that I have always felt an absolute affinity with people in speech and language studies because they have to understand all those processes. I, I didn't know that, but the study of child linguistics and then the study of syntax and semantics at MIT actually um, just made me dive into what language is. And then from that, understanding pathology of language, and that was more aphasia and the, the VA hospital, Harold Goodglass, Edith Kaplan, but especially Norman Geshwin, the behavioral neurologist and his the, the kind of daughter legacy, Martha Denkel, who became my mentor. All of these people provided an understanding of the multiplicity of processes that are necessary for us to read. And that background couldn't have been more meaningful to me to this point. You really had to study all of it. And, you know, I am the grateful recipient. That's what I can say. But Carol, Carol Chomsky began that. Uh, she really was an extraordinary person. Noam, of course, is so well known, but Carol was an amazing linguist who, who was very pragmatic about its application to understanding children's language. Yeah. Do you, do you look back at that now and you look at that, okay, that, that, that incident or the, is it the experience in Hawaii and how it kind of led you on this path of inquiry, and then how from that you met, you know, Chal and Chomsky and Geshwin and all these other people. Do you do you look at that now and just kind of see that that path that has has led you to where you are and the kind of the fate of that or the the fortune of that? You know, Pasteur said something. It's translated in different ways, chance or invention, but 
whatever word you use, invention comes to the prepared mind. And I will be forever grateful and want something similar for our teachers because of the preparation that I that I was given and that I will also have to say I had to build. We were bootstrapping then. There yeah. was no such thing as cognitive neuroscience at that point. The name came later, but those of us who were studying what would be called neuropsychology or neurology and, and linguistics and psycholinguistics, and of course, in the reading lab, uh, 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 what does all this mean to the teaching of reading? What does it mean to curricular development? What is it? All, all those parts, I believe, will make better teachers. Yeah, they all coalesce. They all come together. And I, I wish we could have uh, um, a version of that. And I'm working on that in California and in a collaborative between UCLA and um, California State Universities. How can we better prepare our teachers, whether we call it the science of reading, the neuroscience of reading, or whether we call it, we're, we're working on names here that will pull people together rather than make you right. Them think that you know so we're using terms we're trying to figure out terms like comprehensive systematic teaching of reading c store so that you can you can absolutely dissolve the 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 sense of alienation that some teachers feel because they think oh science means only one thing or science means phonics and not them or not their emphasis on vocabulary and story books and we want a very much uh, and you and I are determined on this Laura I, I mean maybe people in this interview don't know we meet every three weeks <laughs> <laughs> we'll tell you about that in a minute yeah yeah but we're determined to be inclusive at the same time, just as the study of all this was systematic. We need systematic knowledge and we need explicit systematic developmental integration of all these parts in our teaching. So I think if people really understood and you're very, you're, you're, um, you're very perspicacious in making me think out loud about what it took for me to, to devote my life to the reading brain circuit for the teaching of reading. You're very, that's very clever, Laura. I never thought of it that way. But the reality is that's what I want for our teachers, that they understand each of these processes well and how they have to work together. And it's not at the exclusion of anything but it is and has to be systematic developmental integration by their explicit attention to each of it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, and what, what we have to provide for our teachers, they have to provide for their children, right? That's exactly, that's exactly it. And when you do that, it's, you are, it's, it's so odd. Again, all these things you're asking me, but there's, there's so many things going on in California right now about people who are teaching um, and devoting their lives to English language learners. We have so much of our state who are English language learners. And they're worried that the study of dyslexia or the science of reading will actually be detrimental to English language learners in some way. But what it will be incumbent upon people like you and me is to help them understand that this is about learning the English language in all its complexity to, to teach reading. There, there, there was a group of people from Japan, neurologists and educators, who once visited um, a side visit to, to learn of my particular intervention at RAVO for their kids who have um, neurodiverse learning situations. But they came away and they said, you know what? We'll, we'll use it in dyslexia, but what we're really going to do is use it for our kids who are learning English. I thought, oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> I never thought of it that way. Mm -hmm. but, but when we're really teaching 
all of this. We're teaching English language and all in all its cognitive, linguistic, motoric, affective, social, emotional complexity. Mm -hmm. It's all the systems that that come that coalesce and help. So how do our teach? How do we help our teachers understand that, but also understand um, the science of learning yeah. in general? Like how do we as human beings learn? And how does that intersect with the learning of language, with the learning of the written language, with the learning of reading? Right? And social, emotional, and cultural. And you know, you're you're putting a another interesting um, thought in my head, in which whatever we learned as graduate students in my particular program, it had to begin with child development. We had to learn all the systems. We had Shep White, Sheldon White, Jeremy Anglin, uh, actually Helen Togger Flussberg, who now does all this beautiful work on autism, was my TA. <laughs> Can't believe I can remember these things, but um, they were giving us as the planks of the platform, how do we learn in all those domains and they're all involved in reading so we probably would be banned from any teaching curriculum certification process by the end of our talk because we're going to have teachers in, in graduate school for 10 years <laughs> but, uh, there's so much to learn so um so i think one of the things that you brought up for me that's been kind of an aha I do think for, for a very long time, reading wasn't thought of as a linguistic or a language-based endeavor. I, and I do think that took us away from, you know, the studies that we needed to do to prepare ourselves to understand the process of reading. Um, it's always been a surprise to me that people don't, when you say what reading is reading is written language written language. language and that the idea that people don't automatically realize they must study how language works in all its you know orthographic semantic syntactic phonological morphological all those concepts, all those systems right all of them you they're each in and and, and not only they, are they important, they are essential. You know, they are essential to understand. They all contribute to fluent comprehension. And any one of them, when it's not developed sufficiently, will make that child just a little less likely to reach fluent comprehension in the time that we need, which is by the end of third grade. Right, right, yeah. So, 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 okay, so we've talked about, you know, kind of your, your shift from English and English literature into, um, you know, psychology and neurology and human brain development, et cetera. And I know you've been a professor and a researcher at Brandeis and Harvard and Tufts and UCLA. So what's been what has been the through what has been that through line of the work that has kind of kept all those pieces together? It's very simple at a certain level. I want, and I, I, I have this is my second slide in every presentation. Literacy is a basic human right across every zip code, across every state, across every country. And as you know, I, I, I told you before we started the interview, I decided to wear a dress that is from South Africa and a jacket that is from Asia so that we at some point realize that all our work isn't just for the kids in our country or in our backyard, though that is essential. What we do here I, I hope we'll always contribute to global literacy. We are in a connected world. 
And when we make our world healthier and more educated, everybody... It benefits everybody. Right. Everybody is connected now. We wouldn't have this COVID crisis if it weren't... I mean, that's the, as you call it, the shadow side of our connectedness. You know, there are sad sides to being connected and there are gladsome. And I think the work that Laura, you and every, Maria and everybody in the Reading League are doing for our country is also for our world. And the more we see ourselves as connected to that world, you know, the, the more hope I have for our planet. Mm, agreed. You know, speaking of that interconnectedness or that internationalness of this, um, you know, the book, the Proust and the Squid was a, a truly a kind of a game changer for me when I read it. And I know it's been translated into so many languages around the world. What is it about that text do you think that has really resonated with people? What do you hear? What, what do people say to you? What kind of feedback do you get? You know, what is amazing to me is that I still get almost, I certainly get letters weekly from readers, but I still get letters about Proust and the Squid uh, with such regularity and from teachers who uh, to, to take it to the beach. And one of my favorite experiences was on a just a remote beach in Martha's Vineyard. And my sister was, who's a chatterbox. I mean, if you think I talk like my sister Karen. <laughs> and I'm trying to relax. I truly am trying to relax. And I love people. But that day we were in this, I don't know why we're on the back of a hate. I don't know why we were in this place. Oh, we were doing a tour, some kind of a nature tour. And these two women, were talking about the book they were reading. And my sister started talking to them. And I just leaned back and said, I'm not going to talk to anybody. And Karen <laughs> said, my sister wrote that book that you're reading. <laughs> <laughs> and then it was like, oh, my God. That some people would take it on their vacation. And they showed me all the underlining. And what they said, and this is, it's just warmed my heart was that they would underline passages that could teach them, but that gave them a sense of the beauty of it all. And I was so touched. Oh. You know, it was, it, every writer wants to find the, as Italo Calvino says, the, uh, the precise word that will express their thoughts but you also, as a writer, want to give the beauty of reading, the beauty of written language. And when, when people write me about that, I want to weep. I want to weep because you do not know as an author. You, do, you know that. Yeah. You, you know that. Or you do not know how things will be. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you speak so eloquently to that, to the poetry of language, the poetry of the written language, the the poetry that we want our students to have access to, um, and I, I I think that is instilled in your writing, um, in not just the way that you write, but also in the heart of your writing. And I'm wondering if that's really what it is that is so a, is such an attractiveness to that. You know what I would say, Laura, is that I hope so. It's, it's my goal to find the words that will give them a sense of their own love of language. Because when we teach, if we teach through the, our own love, we inspire. So it's, there's this great reciprocal between our love of the word and how we can give it away. And when we see, whether we're the author or the teacher, when we see the reader or the student light up their own sense of the beauty and the, 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 the drive within language, you know, there's something um, 
Charles Taylor writes about this, Humboldt in the 19th century, actually Chomsky does too, that there's, there's no perfect rendition of thought into language, but language is our best vehicle. And so when we, when we find the words that help strive towards conveying that drive to give beauty and thought the the clothing of words that is like a little miracle oh yes i i, 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 I see uh, oh I, wish I could remember this uh, language is well proust said you know written language is that fertile miracle of communication that takes place between two people without ever leaving your chair more or less it is it but it's this it's a miracle of communication and it's a drive a generative drive that's within us and when you can find a way to make another person feel like that that was my hope in proust and the squid it was my hope in reader come home um, especially the last letter in that book oh my goodness was it's just you know may i have the grace to give others what I was given. That's it. <laughs> no, I, I, I just, I, I'm writing down some, some phrases that just, they just move me. Miracle of communication, the generative drive, and I love the word reciprocal. Yeah. I think what you're doing is you're establishing a reciprocity, you know, between you and your reader. It's what you hope for. Laura, it's, I have had an experience recently where I'm writing something that may well and most probably will never be, it may never be published, but will never be known as mine. I don't want it to be. It's fiction. And I, I, it's a set of stories. And these stories, one of them just came like, I'm sitting here transcribing. That's all. Oh I'm wow! I'm yeah, just transcribing, and I am. I'm so happy. Then the second story was the absolute opposite. It was like I had one paragraph, and then 100 more pages of being like Jacob wrestling with the angel through the night. You know. That's where El Talon Calvino, you know, wrestling to find the precise words. Oh, yeah. Writing is like that. It's, it can be transcribing and it can be wrestling. And yet both of them are what you are just hoping to give what you, what you want the, the reader to have. Yeah, one of them is like, sometimes it's flowing from your heart and sometimes it's being dragged from your heart. <laughs> Yes, exactly. Breathe. <laughs> and you can imagine what needs more editing. <laughs> so, um, you know, I one thing I wanted to to touch on is, you know, we're talking about your career and, and just, you know, so many um, accomplishments in your career. But I know that you're you're really proud of this uh, becoming a member of the Vatican Academy of Science. And I'd love it if you could tell our listeners about that. So I have had the great good fortune of having one of the best families one could have. And they are the most loving mother and father one could have. But that doesn't mean that my dad had a clue to what I do. Not a clue. He would always tell us, oh, she's still in school. <laughs> and and if called upon to answer what I did. And he was a, he was a very successful businessman. You know, he, he, he was a very intelligent person, but he absolutely couldn't and, and never would read a book I ever wrote. Now my mother, who's a Steinbeck autodidact, she's, you know, she really did know, but my net dad never did until I was invited to the Vatican for the first time to give a lecture. And he, when I came home, 
he said, Marianne, I just want to touch your hand. He said, you know, when, when I go to my reward, I will, I, I'll get there because you, 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 you held the Pope's hand. <laughs> I didn't hold the Pope's hand. <laughs> But it meant so much to him, and it meant so much to my mother. Now, my mother understood what I did, but she was never, ever boastful. And now, Laura, you, you will appreciate this. We come from small towns, right? Everybody puts in their local newspaper what every, you know, every accomplishment, every team. My mother would never ever put anything about any of the four children in the paper, little tiny paper, until the Vatican. Ah! And then she said, Marianne, I would like you to write an article for the El Dorado Daily Journal. El Dorado <laughs> Daily Journal. Yeah. And so I wrote it for, I I don't know how they did it, but the first, I, it's the first time I've ever seen a color photo front page description of me going to the Vatican and Africa too. But but at that point I realized I could never give my family what they gave me, but I could give them what was the sum of their sacrifice. And when I first went to the Vatican and walked up the stairs to meet the Pope, that, that the first Pope was anyway, John Paul. Pope Francis is very different. But all I could think of was uh, the school sisters of Notre Dame and my parents. Their self, their all the sacrifices they made. And I just cried. I cried my, so the picture, my first picture with a Pope is I just, just cried my eyes out. But now it's different. And I've given many lectures and they, this year asked me to become a permanent member of the Academy of Science. And as you know, Laura, there are very few women who are in the Academy of Science and I believe it's only because Pope Francis is so dedicated to the poor and to their education and to their and to making a life better for them. So I think he the the head the chancellor saw my election as representing neuroscience in the science but its translation into educating the poor. So my parents have both died now, and I, I can't let them know. I'm, I'm going to hope very much there's an afterlife so they know. <laughs> I mean, there are better reasons for hoping for an afterlife. But, <laughs> but that's a good one. That's one of mine is mom and dad, thank you. <laughs> so it's all about the sacrifice of those who've come before us, the shoulders upon whom who we stand you know i stand on the shoulders of every teacher and now laura you and maria and all the people who are working so hard in the reading league what you in my opinion are doing you're putting you're making your shoulders as broad as possible like one of those aircraft ships and you are putting them out so our young teachers can learn and fly off you know, I, I I hope you are right. You know, when you talked about, you know, this about the the Vatican and your parents and what they gave you and how this is a way of you kind of you know giving back to them. That's that reciprocity again, isn't it? And I feel the same way. Like what you just said about you know how do we bring our our young teachers up and up you know whole lift them up and and support them in the in the hard work ahead, the hard work to be done. Right. Um, teaching is so beautiful and difficult. And when you said earlier about poetry, uh, you know, I wrote this one article, which is very short for Cap'n magazine, but it was called The Science and Poetry of Learning and Teaching to Read. And they, I want them to have 
I want them to have both of that, uh, of those things, the sense of poetry and the knowledge of science. It's the, the science and the art, right? Yes, yeah, it is. It is. May they, may they never feel that those have to be separate. Mm hmm. Agreed. And, and don't we, and we, that's what we want for our kids too. I always think about, and I probably learned this from you, but you know, it's not, it's not enough to be a competent reader. We want our children to enjoy the benefits and the beauty of a literate life. Right. We want our children to have that experience like you and I had in our little tiny towns and, you know, where Rose Margaret, Sister Rose Margaret set you back with those books and you just... <laughs> You know, that, that became such a lifeblood for you. We want that for our kids. And, and, and you know this, Laura, I have two boys, and both of them have some aspect of neurodiversity. One is dyslexic and, and has become, I think, one of the most talented, he's very typical for dyslexia, talented artist whose, whose hand is just amazing. He can do anything. And the other one is, is a great reader, but can't do anything with his hand and language. Totally dysgraphic. Nobody can read anything. But they teach me um, that we, we never give up on our children. And the literate life can have many shapes and forms. And so though my one son, who's dysgraphic but not dyslexic, has a, a more typical literate life, what my son Ben has is a very selected one. He reads what he most wants to know about, to love. And so he has one of the most beautiful collections of art books that you can imagine. And then he has certain, he, he knows how slow the process of reading is for him. So when he reads a book, it is going to be something he really was. I mean, he was reading, I think it was Nietzsche last summer, but it was just, he chooses books that will really um, elevate him. And um, I, I'll never forget one summer, he finished Brothers Karamazov because it, he knew it was one of my favorite books. And I thought it took him all summer. And I'm so proud of him for many reasons. And I'm so proud of David for all the ways he's become an immersive reader. But interestingly, Laura, and this is this, this other generation, he will use, he'll go back and forth between print and audio. And I'm so curious about how we, our, our, our generation, Laura, can provide inspiration for multiple forms of the reading life multiple forms and never forgetting that there will be individual differences but that for for those who are able i will cling with science to and and, and personal experience to the idea that the book still possesses one of the most ideal forms of containing and conveying knowledge and wisdom. And the experience of reading a book, especially hardcover, I think is really important for us over time to understand. So, but it's, it's, it's I think the real thrust of my message here is that my sons have, you know, people platitudinously say, oh, my children teach me more than I teach them. We teach each other different things. Yeah. That's the again your word, the reciprocity. reciprocity. I cannot tell you how many different things my sons in their different worlds. One is, you know, in, in the Google world and, and world of strategy and has nothing, I have no knowledge of it. And the world of art and, and, making things I can't even imagine how he thinks of these <laughs> yeah. yeah and you know we're all teaching each other when we are at our best as a human species species when we're, we're yeah together we're, we're teaching each other and when we're when we're connected and when we're without fear and 
Um, yeah. So, um, and I love the what, what you talked about, the multiple literacies. Like, you know, it sounds like your son can kind of move seamlessly, you know, in and out of text and print and auditory input. Um, but then you came back to this idea that I think you so eloquently stated in Reader Come Home about the, the, the importance of a book, the importance of print, the importance of that particular medium. Right. I think as, as we become, after COVID, during COVID and after COVID, I think we become more sensitive to both the extraordinary contribution and the limitations of the screen. And um, even though here we are, Laura, if it weren't the screen, you and I couldn't be together. So I am, I, it is not without gra gratitude, but it is also not without caution that there are limitations um, to, to both the communication between humans, among humans, and between author and reader. And I have obviously written a book about this. I'm very aware of the, the changing, expanding science on it. Naomi Barron's a dear friend, and she just finished a book from Oxford Press, How We Read Now, and I, I wrote a foreword for her. And I'm impressed that the research is really supporting the intuitions that I had in Proust and the Squid and then the, 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 the summary of research we knew till 2018 in Reader Come Home, that we comprehend better and more deeply when we have the concreteness of the printed book for the same material, interestingly. So um, the most, I, I guess, telling study was this huge meta-analysis done by Delgado, the student of... Um, Lalo Salmaron in Barcelona. Uh, they're part of what's called the e-read network in Europe. And Naomi Barron is part of that too, and Meng, and there's many wonderful people in it. But they did this huge meta-analysis of studies since 2000, basically, to 2000, I think it was 16 or 17. But basically they find that when you're reading on the same, reading the same material on screen or in print, the comprehension of over 171,000 subjects, that's the pool, was significantly better with the print. And um, uh, Rockefeller Ackerman from Israel did a more qualitative study and showed that it's because th that there's a time, time millis millisecond differences in how we process in both mediums. And the students, they're all high school or more college, were perceiving themselves better on the screen. And she asked why, and she, they said, well, we think we're better because we're faster on the screen. The reality is that they are skimming and they're word spotting and they're browsing. And so they're not getting some of, they're not getting several levels processing that makes critical analysis and empathy more likely to be used by the circuit. So the big, big, big issues for me are, will the medium you use give the same amount of milliseconds to critical analysis, empathy, and insight reflection, which is doesn't always happen anyway, but those are the three big aspects that if they go missing, we will become ever more susceptible to fake news, false information, and, um, and clinging to the familiar silos of information rather than being open and receptive to what democracy man demands, which is multiple voices by its citizenry. And um, I see ever more in, especially in the last years, it's, it's, there's polarization across everything. Even in our areas, Laura, we see increased polarization. And social media, which can actually 
both expand, it can also, in fact, in a threatening way, limit us because we've got so much information, we just go to what we know. And that does not expand. It does not. And that's not what, that is not what will fuel the heart of a democracy. No. So when we come to the end of the day, when we talk about literacy, we're talking about the link between how our citizenry process information to the fullest or to the narrowest domains of their familiar knowledge and don't go beyond it. So we can either narrow democracy and in that process become ever more polarized, or we can realize what's happening and ensure that we have the plurality of what is really a delicate thing. Democracy is delicate, delicate. It's a work in progress. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I had the, the, the pleasure of, of speaking to Parker Palmer about this, oh. about this very, you know, this very issue about how, you know, if we, if we continue to, to tighten our sphere, then we become tribal and we don't recognize the, multipl the beauty of the multiplicity of the world in which we live. And I do want to come back to that multiple voices and that polarization when we talk a little bit about our work with the peaceniks. <laughs> but, but before I get to that, I do want to say, you know, when I read Reader Come Home, that was the big aha for me was this, the idea of empathy and the way you draw that connection between reading on the printed book, the, the concreteness of the printed book, and how we process that and how that development of insight and empathy is connected to that, I think that is, we all have to, we all have to read that and understand that, Marianne. That's so, so important. And I just, I thank you for, for, for enlightening us on that. That's just such a valuable insight for us to have. You know, the, I think one of the greatest contributions from the first books read to a young child to the day we die is when we have the capacity to leave ourselves and understand the thoughts and feelings of another. I mean, you and I began by talking about Jack. Jack is one difficult, complex character. And I, I would never want to be in his shoes or in his mind, but I feel a privilege by being given a glimpse of that other mind. And that's what I really want for all our, our children and our, and our adults is to be given glimpses of the multiple minds and feelings out there and to go and leave ourselves behind for that time to do that. Because when we come back, and there's a theologian who was one of the best teachers I've ever had. Is, he died not that long ago. His name is John Donne, uh, not the poet, theologian. Uh, but he used the term passing over. He used it in theology. He used it in reading. And we would talk about it, that for him, the act of reading was passing over into the consciousness of another and coming back enriched. Enriched. And, it, and that's, again, the reciprocal, the re great reciprocal of reading. But with empathy, that is a really, to, to lose empathy because we're skimming and not really immersing ourselves, what a loss for, for the individual and for our culture and for our world. Our world, you know, I, I think reciprocity is our word of the day here, Marianne. Uh, you know, Laura, I want to tell you something that has seemingly nothing to do with our interview, and yet it has so much to do with reciprocity. Um, during COVID, um, I found two things that were actually just almost, almost miraculously my own antidotes. One was writing again 
as I said, that probably will never be seen by human or known as mine. It's all fiction. But the other was to begin to watch series from Asia. And my kids make fun of me. Because I, I, I happen to love Korea for many reasons. I went on a book tour there. But they are so interested in education. And they're and, and sometimes fanatically so, and, and they worry so much about that. I don't want to use the word fanatically, but so intensely they worry about their children. But they also are, you, you know, the rewards you can see in Pisa. They are, these children are learning so much. And I became so interested in their writing system. And so I thought, I'll start this Korean series, um, uh, you know, a TV series at night. It happened to be about North Korea prejudices against South Korea and South Korea prejudices against the North. Uh, it was a satire, even though it's the great, probably the greatest romantic series on the I I think on television today it's called Crash Landing on You. What's but, it? Wait, what's it called? It's called Crash Landing on You. Not the most glorious title. I don't even know if that's the best translator. I don't know, but that's what the the it's translated as. But the reality was that this writer, and I really hope someday to meet this writer and even the cast or the director because. They portrayed empathy for others in the most horrible circumstances. And yet humor was how it was like the Greek version of drama. They would have the Greek chorus of women in poverty in a North Korean village and the soldiers. And the hero was a North Korean whose virtue was understood even in South Korea as virtue. But I won't tell you more, but I realized that in this moment, this moment when we have so many people acting out and prejudice against our Asian American populations, if I could do one thing, I would have them watch Crash Landing on You in a Korean series there's a Chinese series called Find Yourself, which is about family life. It is hysterical. Again, there's a romantic line through it, and that's great. It's wonderful. But it's more the capturing of the universality of, of, you, of our humans, Korea, China. And then the novel Resistors by Gish Jen about what happens when we lose empathy, when we are in these controlled environments and how resisting that, resisting having prejudice against ourselves as whatever group is dominating, that we must resist. Well, these three experiences, I hope I can write an essay about this, but understanding what is lost, Gishin really shows us what is lost when we don't resist. And these two series, and I can't read either Chinese or Korean, but I can understand the attempt to provide glimpses of universal values that we all share, whatever leadership is there. I mean, the United States has leadership that we don't always want without saying anything. All of the countries in the world, yeah should not only be judged by the failure of their leaders to be the great virtuous people we all hope our leaders to be, but that people in these cultures share values with us. And that to me, I'm using resistors as one of them, but you know, that's what, that's what we want through reading. We film does it in one way, but books, oh my goodness. Books give us this window. It's it, it's truly empathy is truly leaving ourselves behind and becoming something bigger than who we are when we come back. You know, well, first of all, 
thank you for everything you just said. Um, you know, when you talk about leaving ourselves, yeah. and I, 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 I go back to Jack. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, the, the beauty of a book like that is that as we're reading it, we're not just observing Jack. We're, have, we're in a relationship with Jack. Yes. That's the power of that book. Yes. And I cannot imagine reading that book on a screen. I can't imagine listening to that book on audio. I can't imagine anything else than holding those pages as yes. if Marilyn Robinson, yes. you know, were writing them in my hand. Do you know what I mean? There's just, there's a tactileness about it that allows me to deeply engage with it rather than observe it from here. Right. right. Uh, and observe it in a medium that rewards the transitory rather than the immersive. And that's, you're, you're, you're capturing one of the things that I really want people to understand that words also have space. Words can convey space. And a book conveys space. Ideas that we read in this book, oh, you know, I know where in the book that passage is. Maybe I don't know it perfectly, but I know where it is. Ah, on a screen, I've lost all spatial tactile. Mm -hmm. And time is different. Time, time, time is so critical for critical analysis, but for empathy. And, and when you're on a screen, you can stop, but you don't. We have a set to move ever, ever, ever forward. And with a book, you can literally just stop and think. And there's no, if you will, reward for moving on. Rather, the reward is in entering. You know, it's interesting. I was reading not too long ago. I can't remember what the, the book was, but it was so good. And I was, um, I, and I came to a, a, a phrase or a sentence that I wanted to remember. But because I was so enraptured in the, the flow of the story, I kept reading and I just made a mental note to myself. I wanted to come back. And I just kept reading and reading because I just, you know, I was just so immersed in it. Yeah. But then when it came time to go back and find that, I could find it because I had a, a visual, oh, I had a map of where that was. And so I could go back and find it. Yeah. So my, my son, the artist, has a new, uh, uh, he's always doing different things, but his newest genre is to make these huge, I, I can only call them urns because they're it's up to my waist, they're huge and they're memory maps. And he won't, he, you know, he has his own kiln and he usually is drawing or painting, but he paints the spatial, whatever the person is, he's done them for Aspen, what is Aspen like in the summer? What is Aspen like in the winter? And I just saw yesterday his in-laws to be had asked, commissioned him to make a memory map of their lives and their place in LA. And I was just, I was just astonished. In a way, I'm I had never thought of memory map as a way of thinking about a book's contribution that's unique. But that's just what you just said. Memory. It's like we have a memory map. And it's not perfect, but it's there. It's oh. there. Well, then, I mean, first of all, I just have to say that sounds like an amazing project and oh. like, a, 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 like a beautiful piece of art. Like it's almost like a organic or living, you know, piece of art. Yeah. I, I'm so shocked. My in-laws to be, or whatever one calls them, <laughs> uh, we were celebrating Pesach last night together, and I hadn't been in anybody's house, or anybody's house for months. So I walk in and I, you know, I, I, you know, I gave them flowers, and they said, "Oh, we'll put the flowers next to," and I didn't hear what they said, and then I look because I had a Japanese flower arrangement, and and then I look, I said, "What is this?" I said, oh my God, 
this is my son's creation. And, you know, I want all our children. And remember, Ben is dyslexic. And he had to fight a system that wasn't set up for him. And the says, as you and I know, Laura, it's still not set up for our children who are neurodiverse as much as we will work you and I and everyone in Reading League towards that goal. Um, when you realize that so many of our children who are dyslexic or neurodiverse have all these talents within them, we have to keep them alive. Yes. So they yes. Can contribute. That's our exactly right. Our job is to keep their spirit alive and well as they endure a system that sometimes is actually even in antagonism to the way they learn. But we, the Reading League is, you know, I, as you know, I, I feel the Reading League is, could be called Reading Warriors. <laughs> well, you know, I, yeah, you know, I, we have to, we have to hold their dignity close. They have to, we have to hold their dignity close. Right. And honor their dignity, you know. Um, so Who I wanted to. What they're going to become? We don't know. We have no clue. Right. We have we, no and, clue. We... and it doesn't matter. Whatever we whatever we can do to have them reach their potential to be happy, productive, and at peace with themselves, and not at war with themselves, as as you and I probably have. I don't even want to know how many letters I've had from adults who write me because they have finally understood what was different about them because their children are diagnosed and they have endured so, so much, much of an internal war unnecessary. Yeah. Year after year after year. Right. Well, I wanted to, you, you, when you mentioned you hadn't been out of the house for a while and when you talk about, how the system's not set up for everybody. That reminded me of this article that you recently published with Comer Yates and Renee Boynton Jarrett. And I wanted to, to just lift that up for a minute for our listeners. And I'm going to read the, the, a paragraph of this and then have you comment on this. Too many schools haven't been safe for our children or their teachers since long before the current pandemic erected further barriers to children's learning. Therefore, it cannot be an option to return to the same education system that has failed to meet the needs, hopes, and potential of the children most harmed by systemic inequities and racism. So this is from an article called The Coming Literacy Crisis, There's No Going Back to School as We Knew It. Um, and you just published it, actually. It was just published this week in uh, Ed Week. But I wonder if you could just you know, comment um, for our listeners about your we know what what you and the other authors have have identified as this two point plan to fix what's fundamentally broken for generations. You know, it is such a hard thing to be a patriotic, loyal citizen of this beautiful experiment of a country, and to confront that we're still dealing with problems that are two centuries old and yet we are and we have not by and large we have not faced the fact that our zip codes determine the quality of education in the united states of america that is not something any of us can really believe i mean we still can't believe there can be that much disparity. And yet, for Comer Yates, who's the director of the Atlanta Speech School, and uh, Renee, uh, Renee is this amazing pediatrician and epidemiologist um, who's been working on trauma, especially with children of color for years and years. For each of us in our different ways, we have come to this conclusion that we have had a tale of two cultures for over two centuries and that it is time and maybe 
one of the only silver linings or one of the few silver linings of COVID is that we are pressing our face against the window on those two, on those, on those two realities. And so when we talk about the crises or the epidemics, we, we're talking about the dual ones. And um, we are determined, we're determined to at least describe what exists. And with Comer, we looked at, for example, fluency rates in all the cities in NAEP, the, the NAEP results. And what you saw in Atlanta was how the privileged schools and the zip codes with the Caucasian privileged families reaching really high levels of, fluent, of proficiency, whereas the, the, the children of color in the, especially the, and underprivileged zip codes were almost 50% below that. We are, it was staggering in Atlanta. LA was terrible, but you would look at city after city and you would see these disparities. And they're, if you will, they're just right in your face. You don't have to, you know, you, 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 you just, all you have to do is visit, <laughs> just visit. And, but you not only you visit the school that has had such a disparity, you visit the schools where they say no to that. We're gonna do the best we can for all children. And I, I think of the Harlem zone, I think of the places that I, that I visited where they, they are determined like my school sisters of Notre Dame, everybody reads, everybody reaches their potential. Well, we have to have that kind of philosophical and statistic based reality check. What are the stats? Let's use them. And now that we have this relief package, let's be very intelligent. This is my worry that we will see this money as a way of just throwing money at a problem instead of being very intelligent. Where is it going to do the most good who, for the children who need it most right now? And so, and it is, and it is, you know, it is not taking away from any privileged child. I want all children to be privileged, but I'm not talking economic privileged. I'm talking written language privilege, linguistically privileged, socially, emotionally privileged. I want our children to actually have an experience that my brothers and sister had in this tiny, very poor school. Two rooms. It wasn't about money. It was about dedication and conviction that every child can reach their potential. That's what I want. And that darn, I mean, the, the statistics are really terrible. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And, and, I th and the other thing you bring up in this article is the fact that, um, you know, this is, we, we failed our teachers in many ways too. And you, and you bring up the, the statistic that 78% of teachers report mental and physical exhaustion yeah. and, and the importance of equipping our teachers with the tools necessary to fight this cycle of injustice. Yes. Oh, uh, you know, Laura, I, I used to always make it a point, almost to the point of having a note beside my presentations, never neglect how amazing it is to have teachers who keep going despite less money, less status, less resources, and in the places we're talking about, really uh, mitigating circumstances that are aversive. You know, some of the environments are as risky for teachers as, as the students. What do we do about that? And I, I, you know, there's a side of me that wants just to embrace teachers everywhere and say, thank you. But another side of me says, okay, we are, we are 
we we are an army. We have to have discipline, and the discipline is the disciplines of knowledge. We have to be armed with knowledge, and we have to have trained teachers, and we have to have trained teachers who are given resources and are given given the acknowledgement that I think COVID may have have actually given to some teachers that the parents didn't realize what it's like to have to teach their child, their own child. So that's another part of the silver lining to understand what teachers are doing during their days and how tired and exhausting it is. One of the all, all, one of the things I always want to say to teachers, I know how weary you are. I know how weary you are. And Laura, you and I, through through knowledge and through, if you will, inspiration, inspirate, give breathing room to our teachers. They need to be inspired and they need to be acknowledged. And they that acknowledgement is financial in some ways in terms of the resources of the school and their classroom, but financially in terms of what their monetary reward is. And also they need to be appreciated. So all of that is one piece of COVID that um, yeah. I think this article was trying to represent and say, you know, they are tired and emotionally drained. And worst of all, this is what always kills me. They're blamed for everything society didn't get right. We put on the backs of teachers. Agreed. Well, I think, you know, teaching is not for the faint of heart. No. And it's a marathon. It's a marathon. It is. And I don't blame all the teachers who say can't do it, but I, I want to uplift those and, you know, hold their, hold their arms, hold their arms. We, we have your back. We as a nation should be like Finland and Korea. We have our teachers back and we have, we acknowledge you, we appreciate you and we support you. And I think that's, I mean, that, that's so much of your work. That's so much of our work here at the Reading League. Um, you know, I, I do want to mention, so thank you for that. Thank you. Um, and I'll put this article, link this article in our, in our show notes as well. And I do want to mention, um, our little group of, of, uh, <laughs> People, we get together. I just need to tell our listeners that that uh, Jan Hasbrook, uh, Janine Heron, uh, Mar uh, Margaret Goldberg, Marianne, myself, Margie Gillis, Jan Wazowicz. We get together, call ourselves the Peaceniks, and we are just part of a. We are literacy warriors, to use your your word, uh, Marianne. And really, what we're trying to do is 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 recognize the multiple voices and try to end the polarization so that we can all come together for the betterment of teachers and children and for the advancement of this idea of reading as a um, as a as a necessary um, a necessary skill for leading a rich and a rich life of reciprocity. Um, and I just have to, the reason I wanted to mention that is I just have to thank you um, for the gift of being with you and these other wonderful people um, to be able to have these kinds of conversations. And it feels to me like the conversation you and I have been able to have today is one that we've been able to have as part of our little peaceniks groups, but now we're going to elevate this to our reading league community in hopes that everybody in that reading league community is enriched by this conversation as I have been, Marianne. Well, so. thank you, Laura. I knew, as I said at the beginning, that this is one of those occasions when a responsibility to try to talk about these issues is a joy because of you and the Reading League and all the people who are part of it. It's just, uh, you know, it makes, it makes me happy 
not to have left English literature behind, but to have incorporated it with science so that we together have something for that next generation to aspire to be elevated and uplifted by and have fun too. Exactly. <laughs> you know, um, I tell you, we, we could walk, we could, you and I, I feel like we could talk for another hour. So we've got, let us make a date to have a part two at some point. But I do want to um, close out our, our discussion today with what I call our rapid fire questions, Marianne, which are the questions that I ask everybody on our podcast. So, and you may, you may have already answered some of these. So the first question is, who was your favorite teacher growing up and why? Oh, gosh. I really have to say I want to give all so many teachers my love because they they inspired me. So every single one of those school sisters of Notre Dame, my teachers in high school, there were several who just absolutely helped me so much. But in college, I would say my favorite teacher was Father John Dunn, the theologian, who taught me that our God is not to be found only in churches and temples and synagogues, but our God is a wild God who lives within us. And that has all together changed my life so that it's the search for God rather than the, anything else that actually helps me with, with, with every day of my life. So I guess my favorite teacher will always be John Donne, who brought literature, poetry, theology, history, and just the love of one human for the transcendent goodness, the transcendent. So, okay. Oh. Thank you, Father John Dunn, for that. Thank you. Um, now, this one, I know you're not going to be able to answer one book, but I'll ask you anyway. What is a favorite book, either, either as a child or as an adult? And we've already talked a lot about our mutual love of Marilyn Robinson, but what's what are some other, a, other one other book that you think you really comes to mind? I think the book, and I wrote about this in Proust and the Squid, the book that just... I keep coming back to over and over is Middle March by George Eliot. And um, I come back to it because Dorothea Brooke, the character, is is like, like us, Laura. She is in a small town and she makes mistakes, but she never gives up trying to find the good and do the good for others. And in so doing, she is she will be both never remembered and never forgotten at that one level. So middle March. Mm, beautiful. Um, what are you reading right now? <laughs> I you will you will die when you see what I'm reading right now. This is horrible. So, uh, I have, I, you know, Noam Chomsky, who was a dear, who became a real friend, um, he has book stacks, and I have book stacks. Now, these are the ones, <laughs> these are the ones that I have every day. Here's a new one on creativity, but uh, there's also one that this, <laughs> Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a book of oh, poetry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, this one someone just gave me, Between Heaven and Mirth. Now, you see, now these stacks are all, if you look, they're philosophy and theology with a little bit of, you know, Wendell Berry and Gischian in there, Herman Hesse. So these are the stacks. I won't take you upstairs, but upstairs <laughs> are the stacks of novels that... So it, it's like each room has its own. Actually, they're all categorized by and then alphabetized. Yes. These, these stacks aren't alphabetized, but the shells are all alphabetized by category. So 
So you've got multiple a multiplicity of books going on simultaneously. I, I find that helpful. <laughs> you never know where you need to go. I mean, it, you, you don't know you don't know what's going to call to you. I never know, but I, I love them all. <laughs> so, um, what are your greatest hopes for today's children? And I think you've probably answered that, but if you could just share with us one last beautiful, beautiful nugget of language from Marianne Wolf. Oh, I, my, my desire for children is that they may, through their great efforts and through ours, reach their potential for contributing to their small worlds, our larger worlds, our planet, and in so doing, help our species become something of beauty in its evolution. <laughs> I don't know. That's just my first thought. Beautiful. And it's just, it's, that was beautiful, Marianne. This whole conversation has been a beautiful experience for me. Thank you so much. I can't wait to share this with everybody out there. But Laura, it's so reciprocal. <laughs> <laughs> and so I want to end with what John Donna, I said, my favorite teacher always, he said, you know, when you're with someone whose thinking elevates your own, you can't help but actually grow and expand. So I think the reciprocal in our conversation was because you actually elicited my best thoughts, which then elicited your best thoughts, which then elicited oh, I love it. Viral. <laughs> and I want to also thank Steve and Mike, those wonderful men who are who are helping with behind the, the scenes. Fun. Behind Steve, the, Steve and Mike. All these behind the scenes people, and we thank them. We thank them all. Well, thank you so much for this. And um, and I again I'm just gratitude. Me too. <laughs> and blessings on everyone during this very holy week across all religions and and unbelief. Doubting is a important part of being important part. It elevates us all. Yes, thank you. After that, I really don't know what to say. I mean, my admiration for Marianne is deep and wide, and I know many of you feel the same way. I hope you enjoyed today's podcast, um, and maybe you'll listen to it more than once. I know I will, because of all the wonderful and beautiful words of wisdom and thoughtfulness that she brought to this conversation. Um, so I hope you enjoyed this. If you do enjoy this podcast, uh, please make sure to rate us and also share with your friends and colleagues. We thank you for being our uh, guest today and for joining us on this podcast. Please make sure to check out The Reading League at www.thereadingleague.org and see many of the other ways that we support you in your important work. Again, thank you.